All right, so today we're going to be talking about chapter 10, which is the chi-square chapter. Okay. So we're going to be discussing the chi-square test and the measures of association. Now, what is uh, chi-square? So chi-square is a statistical hypothesis testing procedure, okay? And it's similar to the t-test in the sense that you're testing a hypothesis about a population based upon sample statistic data, okay? So what we're doing is we're doing inferential statistics. We have a population we're concerned about. We don't have access to the entire population. So we pull a sample from that population and use that sample data to test the hypothesis we have about the population. Okay. Now, we learned about a test a, a few weeks ago called the t-test. Okay. Now, that was another statistical hypothesis testing procedure. Now, the t-test, remember, one of the assumptions of the t-test was that your dependent variable be measured at the interval ratio level. Now, what makes well, one of the main reasons why you want to use the chi-square test is let's just say that you have a hypothesis and you have two variables, an independent variable and a dependent variable, and your dependent variable is an interval ratio. Your dependent variable is nominal and or ordinal. So let's just say you have two variables and both are nominal and ordinal, you would want to use the chi-square test. So it's similar to the t-test in the sense that you're testing a hypothesis about a population and we're using sample statistic data, but again with the chi-square test, you're going to be using nominal, you're going to be using this if you have nominal or ordinal data. Okay. And in fact, the logic behind the chi-square is somewhat similar to the logic behind the uh, t-test. Okay, so as we said already, the chi-square test is an inferential statistic technique that, again, is designed to test for significant relationships between two variables organized in a bivariate table, what we refer to as a crosstab. Okay. Now, one thing about the chi-square is it really requires no assumption about the shape of the population distribution from which a sample is drawn. So if you remember one of the assumptions of the t-test was that the population that we're pulling from, the variable in the population is normally distributed, or that our sample, si sample size is 50 or larger. Now, the reason why this was one of the requirements is because if the sample size is 50 or larger, then we knew that our sampling distribution was going to be... Normal. Okay. Now, like I said, we we there's no requirement for the chi-square test related to the shape of the distribution that we're pulling from. And one of the reasons why is because with nominal and or ordinal level data, you typically don't see normal distributions. There's no mean, so there's no below the mean, there's no above the mean, and you don't typically see nominal and or ordinal level data being normally distributed. Okay. Um, and like I said already, um, you're going to use the chi-square test when you have nominal and or ordinal level data. Okay. So let's take a look at this cross tab. And I, I want you to tell me, based upon this cross tab, you look at the two things, two variables, sex and fear of walking alone at night. I want you to tell me which variable is the independent variable and which variable is the dependent variable. The dependent is the yes and no, and the independent is the sex. Good, 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 Ollie. So sex is the independent variable, right, that we think is going to influence whether or not people are afraid to walk alone at night, right? And the two options for that variable are yes and no, okay? So we're seeing in this cross-tab whether or not males are more likely or are females more likely to say, I'm afraid to walk alone at night, okay? Now, of course, looking at this, Cross tab, comparing the percentages between males and females, does there appear to be a relationship between sex and whether or not you're afraid to walk alone at night? Yes. Okay, so saying yes. Why would you say that there's a relationship? Uh, I would say there's uh, huge differences between each other, that they're not um, you know, 
very close. The numbers are not exactly the same. Anyway. So, so in, in the sense that, like, if we're looking at the percentage of males, okay, who said, no, I'm not afraid to walk alone tonight, 87% of males said, no, I'm not afraid to walk alone, right? Well, only 40% of females said, no, I'm not afraid to walk alone at night, right? And of course, it's the exact reverse when we look at yes, 13, only 13% 13 of males said, yes, I'm afraid to walk alone at night, while 60% of females said, yes, I am afraid to walk alone at night, right? So the percentage point difference between males and females is actually quite large. And if you remember from last week, the way that we know that there's an association is we compare the percentages across the categories of the independent variable. And one of the things that I was telling you was that in, in general, the larger the percentage difference, the stronger the association. Now I told you that's kind of like an eyeball test. There's a mathematical way to determine whether or not a relationship exists. And there's a mathematical way to determine the strength of the relationship. And that's what you're gonna be learning about today. So the chi-square test is a way to actually determine whether or not a relationship exists, first off. And then you're going to learn about the measure of association, which tells you how strong the association or how strong the relationship is. But of course, just doing the eyeball test here, it's clear to see that there is a relationship between these two variables. Okay. Now, in order to determine whether or not there's a relationship or not, beyond just the eyeball test, uh, we need to talk about something called statistical independence, because this is what the chi-square test test is. Okay. Um, now, statistical independence, I'm going to read this PowerPoint, but this is all just with the textbook jargon. This is a, statistical independence is just a really big, fancy term for a really simple concept. Okay. So statistical independence is the absence of association between two cross-tabulated variables. Okay. So what, what we're saying, if we're saying two variables are statistically independent, we're saying the percentage distributions of the dependent variable within each category of the independent variable are identical. Again, this is a fancy way to say that the independent variable has no influence on the dependent variable, or the two variables don't influence or impact the, each other in any way. Okay. Now, if this were, of course, the case, and let's just say that this cross tab that we just looked at if these two variables were statistically independent, then we wouldn't see 87% for males and 40% for females. These percentages would be identical, okay? If we're saying that the two variables are statistically independent, okay? So if the two variables were statistically independent, then the percentages would look something like this, where we know that 59% of the sample said, no, I'm not afraid to walk alone at night. And 41% of the sample said, yes, I am afraid to walk alone at night. And if sex has no influence on whether or not people are afraid to walk alone at night, then the percentage of males who should have, should have said, no, I'm not afraid to walk alone at night, is, should be 59%. And the percentage of females who should have said, no, I'm not afraid to walk, walk alone at night, should be 59% as well. Likewise, the percentage of males who should have said, yes, I am, should be 41%. The percentage of females who, sh who should have said, yes, I am afraid to walk alone tonight, should also be 41%. So that's what we mean by the second sentence, that is the percentage distributions of the dependent variable within each category of the independent variable are, are identical. So again, statistical independence, all it is, it's a fancy way to say that these two variables do not influence each other. So sex doesn't influence whether or not you're afraid to walk alone tonight. Now, looking at these numbers and these percentages that we have right in front of us, this cross tab suggests that these two variables don't influence each other because the percentages are identical. This cross tab suggests that the two variables do influence each other, that sex is heavily correlated with whether or not you're afraid to walk alone at night. Does, so, does everybody understand the concept of statistical independence? Yes. Good, yeah. thank you. Cool. Like I said, it's just a big term, but it's a pretty simple concept, actually. Um, okay, so, like I said, what we're doing with the chi-square test is we are testing this whole concept of statistical independence. We're seeing whether or not these two variables influence each other in the population that we're looking at, okay? Now, the chi-square test 
follows five steps, like all statistical hypothesis testing procedures. Now, the first step is you need to make assumptions, right? Similar to the t-test, right? Unlike the t-test, we don't have like a bunch of assumptions that we need to meet. There's really only like one or two assumptions that need to be met. Second thing that we need to do is we need to state the research, state the null, and select the alpha level, okay? Similar to the t-test. If you all remember, we state both the research and we state the null hypothesis. Can anybody remind me why we state both the research hypothesis and the null hypothesis? Why don't we just state the research hypothesis? Well, because you are trying to stay that you're saying something might be different than the current hypothesis, that you're making an assumption different from what is presently understood. So you have to state what is currently assumed. Mm, right. So when we state our research hypothesis, this is what we believe. As a researcher, you know, we believe that this to be the case, right? So in our example, with our current cross tab, I would believe that sex influences whether or not you're afraid to walk alone at night. Now, of course, I would believe, just looking at the data there, that males are less likely to say they're afraid to walk alone at night, and females are more likely to say that they're afraid to walk alone at night, right? So that would be my research hypothesis. So I state that research hypothesis, and then I state the null hypothesis right below it, and it's the null hypothesis that, that we go about testing. So we don't test the research hypothesis. We state it, we leave it alone, and then what we're trying to do is we test the null hypothesis. Hopefully we can reject the null hypothesis, which provides support for our original research hypothesis. And so we test the null, we don't test our research hypothesis. And one of the reasons why we do that is because as a researcher, we don't want to have a biased study. And what do I mean by that? You don't want to st state the research hypothesis then test the research hypothesis as if it's fact, and then go about trying to prove the research hypothesis to be true, right? Similar to how I said with the t-test, you wanna kind of think about the t-test as kind of like a court trial, right? There's, when you go into a court trial, right? Let's say you're a jury, you're, you're on the jury, and then we have a defendant, right? We don't start off with the assumption that the defendant's guilty. Right. You never want to be a defendant where, you know, everybody just presumes you're guilty. It's like, all right, well, let's just like convict him and get this over with the guy's guilty already. There's a presumption of innocence. Okay. And in a similar sense, there's a presumption that the null hypothesis is true until there's enough evidence to show that the null hypothesis is just so unlikely and so improbable to where we reject it. Okay, so again, ideally we try to reject the null hypothesis. There's two things that we can do with the null hypothesis. We can either reject it, or what can we do with the null hypothesis? We can either reject or... Fail to reject. Good, fail to reject, right? So we never accept the null hypothesis. Just like you never say, like I said, if we're in a court trial, we never say that the person's innocent. We don't say guilty and innocent. We say guilty or not guilty because we're not saying that the person didn't do it. We're just saying that there just wasn't enough evidence. Just like if there's not enough evidence to completely reject the null hypothesis, does not mean we accept the null hypothesis. We're just saying that there's not enough evidence to uh, completely discount the null hypothesis, okay? So we state our research, we state our null, we test our null hypothesis, okay? Now again, um, the textbook says select the alpha level. Um, what are the three traditional alpha levels that we use? Point zero one, point zero five, and point zero zero one. So point zero five, point zero one, point zero zero one. Good. And like I said, the textbook will tell you say that you should select the alpha. But like I said, in the social sciences, you would typically just report all three. Step number three: you select the sampling distribution, and you specify the test statistic. Now, when we were doing the t-test, we had we were using the t-distribution, and we were calculating the t-statistic. Okay. Um, when we're doing the chi-square test, we are selecting the chi-square distribution, and we're going to specify the chi-square statistic. So in case you're wondering if you read the book already, um, it's not pronounced chi-square or chi-square, it's pronounced chi-square. Okay. 
Okay, so after you select the chi-square distribution and specify the chi-square statistic, the next thing you're gonna do is you're gonna compute the chi-square statistic, okay? And we're gonna learn the formula for that. And then we're gonna make a decision and interpret the results. And what we mean by make a decision and interpret the results, we're gonna determine whether or not we're going to reject, or whether or not we're going to fail to reject the null hypothesis. Similar to the five step we did the t-test. Okay, now like I said, Assumption, let's take it for step one. Again, one of the assumptions of the chi-squared test is that you're using random sampling. Again, we don't need to worry about the shape of the distribution of the population we're pulling from, so we can just forget that assumption. But we do need to make sure that our sample is a random sample. The reason why is because if we're doing some type of like probability sampling, random sampling, um, we know in general that our sample is going to look relatively similar to our population. If we're not using some type of probability sampling, then we might have a biased sample, and there's no guarantee that our sample is going to look like our population. And if that's the case, we can't infer to our population based upon our sample data. Okay. And like I said, one of the other assumptions is that we're using nominal and or ordinal level data. Now, let's talk about the research and the null hypothesis. Like I said, you state both the research and you state the null. Now, the research hypothesis is the hypothesis that we as the researchers believe to be the case. Okay. So again, it proposes that the two variables are related in the population. So unlike the t-test, when you're writing the um, research and the null hypothesis and you're doing it for the chi-square test, you're going to be using words. So what do I mean by that? Um, if you remember, I don't know if you do remember, but if you remember from the t-test in chapter eight, one of our hypotheses was that the mean wages of African-Americans was gonna be less than the mean wages of all Americans, which we specified as 28,985. So we wrote H subscript one, mu represent the mean wages of African-Americans, was less than 28,985. Okay, so we use population parameter notation. We use less than, greater than, or not equal to, then we had some specified value. When we had a two sample t-test, we used mu, less than, greater than, or equal to, some other mu, because we were doing a two sample t-test. We wrote the null hypothesis was equal to, right, 28,985. But, okay, now when you're doing this for the chi-square test, you're not going to be using any type of like mathematical notation. You're going to write your research hypothesis, hypothesis and your null hypothesis using words. So if I were to do this for the chi-square, I'm going to use words, and I don't have to worry about this population parameter notation. Okay, so like I said, um, my research hypothesis, it would, I would state it using words, and I'd say, and it says something like the two variables are related in the population. Now, like I said, you can have a direction here as well. So I, I, if I was talking about sex and fear of walking alone at night, I would actually have a direction in the sense, well, not necessarily direction, but I would have an opinion in the sense that I think that males are less likely to say they're afraid to walk alone at night, or they're more likely to say, no, I'm not afraid to walk alone at night, right? And of course, vice versa, I would say that females are more likely to say, yes, I am afraid to walk alone at night, okay? So in that sense, I could be very specific. I could also be less specific if I don't actually have like a real opinion about whether or not males or females are more likely to say yes. So in that sense, I would just say that the two variables are related in the population, okay? Now, the null hypothesis, again, it's a statement of no difference that contradicts, or you kind of think about it as the opposite of the research hypothesis, okay? So it says that there's no association between these two variables that you're looking at, okay? So in our example, there's no association between sex and fear of walking alone at night, okay? So if you, when you're looking at the null hypothesis, it says that the independent variable does not influence the dependent variable in any way, and that in the population, the two variables are statistically independent, okay? And like I said, we state the research, we believe that to be the case, we state the null right below it, 
and we test the null hypothesis, hypothesis. We see whether or not it is probable for the null hypothesis to be true. When we pull our sample data, okay, we're going to see whether or not that sample data cast doubt on the null hypothesis, cast doubt on this idea that these two variables are statistically independent, that the two variables don't influence each other. Okay, so if I pull sample data and my sample looks like this, where the sample suggests that 87% of the people, males in the sample said no, while 40% of the females in the sample said no, it's a pretty big difference, right? Like what is the probability that I would pull this sample coming from a population where sex doesn't influence fear, okay? What's the probability of me randomly pulling this sample from a population where sex doesn't influence fear? And that's what the chi-square test kind of does, is it tests the likelihood of this occurring, of the null hypothesis being true, okay? So like I said, if I were to write this, I would write the research hypothesis, something like this. I'll do H subscript one, and I would say something that like sex and fear are statistically dependent in the population. And I might be more specific in the sense that I would say something like males are more likely to say that they are not afraid to walk alone at night. Okay. So I might be specific like that. Okay. Now with the null hypothesis, I would say that there's no association between the two variables. So I would say something like sex and fear are, are statistically independent in, in the population. So sex has no influence on whether or not people are afraid to walk alone at night in the population that I'm pulling from. Okay, so we start off with this whole assumption that the null hypothesis is true, and then we test to see whether or not the null hypothesis is plausible. Whether or not it's practical to think, given our sample data, that this is true. Okay. Um, does this kind of make sense to people? It's kind of like similar to the t test that what we did that we did you know a few weeks ago. Yeah, it's making sense for me. Cool. So this is more for like nominal and ordinal. Yes. Yes. So it's uh, it's for nominal and ordinal level data. So the actual mathematical calculations are different, but the logic behind the null hypothesis, we start off with the assumption that the null hypothesis is true, and we see whether or not our sample data cast doubt on this assumption. It's, it's similar to the t-test in that sense. All right, now in order to calculate the chi-square, um, you first need to calculate the expected frequencies. So what are the expected frequencies? So the expected frequencies are the cell frequencies that we would expect to see in a cross tab, assuming the null hypothesis is true. So it's a frequency that we should see, okay, if the two variables are statistically independent in the population, okay? Now that's in contrast to the observed frequencies and those are the cell frequencies that are actually observed in the cross tab. Now, where do we get the observed frequencies? We get the observed frequencies by taking a sample from the population and creating a cross tab with that sample data. So the observed frequencies are the actual frequency that we see in the real world that we pull from the sample. Okay. Now the expected frequencies, we need to calculate the expected frequencies. Okay, so there's a mathematical equation to calculate the expected frequencies. And the equation is the column marginals, columns, they're, the, they're vertical, they go up and down the like Greek columns. And of course, marginal, a different name for marginal is total. So column total multiplied by row total. So rows are horizontal, they go side to side like your row in a rowboat. So the row marginals are row totals. You're going to take the column total, times the row total, and you're going to divide that by the n, which is the total number of cases in the sample. Okay, so that's everybody in the sample. That's how you get the expected frequency for each cell. Okay, so you need both the observed frequencies, the sample data that you pull from the population, and then you compare that to the expected frequencies. 
Okay. Now, assuming the null hypothesis is true, if the null hypothesis is true, what you should see is that the observed frequencies should be relatively close to the expected frequencies. Okay. Now, if the observed frequencies are way different from the expected frequencies, then that suggests that the two variables are statistically dependent or the two variables influence each other in some way in the population. Everybody still with me? The whole expected frequency versus observed frequency. Yes. I guess my, my question Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, Go ahead. the expected frequency, where do you get that from? <laughs> okay, I'm gonna, show, I'm gonna show you the calculator right now. Okay, so like I said, there's four cells, right? If you remember the intersection of a column and a row is a cell, how many cells do we have up here? How many? Six. No, so what you see to the right are totals. Oh, so four. Four, four. So we have good. So we have four, four cells. We have males to say no, males to say yes, females to say no, females to say yes. So we have four cells. Okay. So what you do to find the expected frequency for each cell, if you're wondering these numbers that you see 21, 3, 14, 21, those are the observed frequencies from the sample that we pulled. Right, so it's hypothetical data, but let's just say those are the observed frequencies. Okay, so to get the expected frequency for males who said no, what you're going to do is you're going to take the column total, which is how many males are in the sample. Then you're going to multiply that by the row total, which is how many uh, people who said no, I'm not afraid to walk alone at night. Um, are in the uh, sample. So I'm going to try to draw it up here. So I'm going to write M for male, F for female, N for no, Y for yes. So we know that there are 21 males. Said so no, three said yes. That is 24 total males. There are 14 females who said no, 21 who said yes. There are 35 females. What is our N here? What is our total number of cases? 59. Good, 59. There's 24 males, 35 females. We have an N which is equal to 59. Good. Now, how many people said, no, I'm not afraid to walk alone tonight? 35. 21 plus 14. How many people said, yes, I am afraid to walk alone tonight? 24, 3 plus 21. Okay, so what we need to do to calculate the expected frequency for each cell, we take the first cell. Males who said no, we take the column total. The column total is how many males there are. How many males are there? 24. 24, good. So we take 24, which is our column total. We multiply it by the row total for that same cell. So this is the column total for this cell. This is the row total, which is 35. We take the column total times the row total divided by the n. So somebody do that for me. 24 times 35 divided by 59 gives us an expected frequency, which is equal to what? 14.23. I'll just round that down to 14, thank you. So we have 14 is our expected frequency. Now that 21 that we saw there earlier, that was the observed frequency. Okay. So as you can already tell, the expected frequency and the observed frequency are relatively far apart. Okay. Now, having said that, does everybody understand how to calculate the expected and the observed frequencies? So are we just doing this like cell by cell? Is yes. This a yes. Okay. So the next one, you're going to go here. This will be the column total. This will be the row total, right? This one, column total, row total. This one, column.
column total, row total, yes. You'd be doing it side by side. So, uh, okay, yeah, I'll just let you, are we gonna work through the rest? Cause I'm still. Yeah, and I actually, so I, if everybody understands this, and even if you don't, I want y'all to give it a shot. So the first one we did, we took this cell. This is the column total, right? We took that 24, multiply it by its row total, 35. 24 times 35, um, you would get? 840. 840, 840 divided by 59, you're gonna get approximately 14, okay? So why don't you go ahead and give this a shot and try to get the rest of the cells, okay? Let's take a second and try to get the rest of the cells. Uh, anybody think that they have all the cells i mean i yeah. I, I feel like i did it wrong because i'm like what so like say i'm at the bottom right and i'm looking at yeah what would have been am i pulling like all the numbers from the left too or am i only working from that side over oh we're only going here this is the column total for this cell this is the row total for this cell so it'd be 35 times 24 divided by 59. So, so the, the one that's diagonal to the one we already did is going to be the same number. It's going to be 14, correct. And then, so then, okay, so the one on the bottom left would be 24 by 24. Divided by 59. By 59 and the top one would 9. be 9.76. Right, so we'll just round eight. that up to 10, good. And then this one would be 35 by 24 divided by 59 is 10 again. 21. No, 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 no. So for this one, the column total is 35. The row total is 35. So we do 35 times 35 divided by 59. So I think somebody said the number was, what's the number? 21. 21, good. Okay, so 21. Everybody get these numbers? Yes. Okay, yeah. so everybody, okay good. So everybody understood how to, how to calculate these expected frequencies? Good. Um, yes. So now that we got the expected frequencies, and then again, we did it by taking the column total for each cell, multiplied by the row total for that same cell, and then dividing by the N, which is 59, that, that never changes. We get the expected frequencies or the cell frequencies that you should expect to see, assuming the null hypothesis is true. Now, one of the ways that we can test to make sure that, uh, you know, we did this right, the frequencies should always add up the total okay so we know that they do okay so we have our expected frequencies now once we get our expected frequencies like i said what you do is you compare your expected frequencies to your observed the further your observed frequencies are away from what you should expect to see the more likely you are to be able to reject the null hypothesis and the more likely you are to say that the two variables are related to each other in the population. Um, let me put the PowerPoint back up here. I have a question. Go ahead. When you have more cells, right now we have only four. 
But what happens when you have more cells? Let's it, say it, it, of... I get you. It doesn't affect it. So let's just say we have another. I'm going to jump back to this. Just say that we have another column here. Yeah. You would have another column total, and then you would do row total, column total, row total. So it doesn't change anything. You just okay. do the exact same procedure. Right. So when you have the result, uh, what did, because always I have problems with the digits. Uh, which one I had to take just uh, round? How can I explain? Well, well, you typically round the two decimals, so uh -huh. decimal, then number, number. The reason why I didn't do it this time is because the textbook created these slides this way, and I just decided to follow them. So they rounded these up to a whole number, so I'm just following that. But typically, if there's no specific instructions telling you to round up or round down to a certain decimal or to a whole number, then it's typically the rule that you do decimal number number. For the homework, we have to take it only the two decimals? Um, unless it says something different. If it says round to a whole number, round to a whole number. Okay. Got it. Okay, so now that we got our observed, so if you remember this 21 that we say, see for males who say no, that's the observed. The three males who said yes, that's the observed. The 14 females who said no, that's the observed. The 21 females who said yes, that's the observed. So those are the observed. And what I have up here on this uh, board is are the expected frequencies. So once we have both the observed and the expected, we're gonna take the observed and the expected, we're gonna calculate the chi-square using the observed and the expected frequencies for each cell. So we're gonna use this equation up here. Okay, now I'm gonna write this equation up here on this board as well, and then we're going to work through how to calculate the chi-square. So chi-square, this is a mathematical, this x with two over is the mathematical equation for chi-square mathematical notation for chi-square, is equal to the sum of the observed frequency, so this F subscript O minus the expected frequency. We square that and then we divide it by the expected frequency. Now, this, how many times are you gonna have to do this? You're gonna have to do this for as many cells as you have. So we have four cells, that means we have to do this four times. Okay, so I'm going to do it for the first one, and then we can, I want y'all to do it for the other three, okay? Now, if you remember, the observed frequency for the first cell, males who said no, the observed is 21. The expected is 14. Okay, that would give us, if we were to do observed minus expected, we'd get 7. Okay, so seven would be here. We take the seven, we would square it up because that's what the equation is telling us to do next. Seven would square up to 49. Okay, so we would have 49 here after we did the squaring. Then we would divide by the expected frequency. The expected frequency is still 14. 49 divided by 14 gives me 3.5. I did it for the first cell. You don't need to do it for the other three cells. Does everybody understand what you need to do here? Yes. Now that you, okay, so now that you do all, after you do the other three, what's the next step? You add them all. Add them all together, sigma, add them all together. And then you have the chi-square. So why don't y'all go ahead and calculate the chi-square. I'm gonna put up this chart here for you, which I think will help you. When you're doing your homework, you might wanna organize the chart like this, the observed and the expected like this. So why don't y'all go ahead and give that a shot right now.
So am I working directly across this? I could basically just work directly across the chart if I'm organizing it like this. So 21 minus 14, 3 minus 10, 14 minus 21. Yeah, yeah. That's ideally the easiest way to do it. Uh, you could do it with the, you know, following this way, but it's probably a little bit easier to follow the chart. Does anybody uh, have the chi-square yet? Uh, I did. Uh, I got 14. All right, so we'll roll 14.2. Good. So that's actually the chi-square. So let's go ahead and do this in case you didn't get that number. What you would do is, this is the first cell, so we already got that. The second cell is males who said yes. The observed was 3. The expected was 10. That gave us negative seven. We square that up and we get 49. And this is where a lot of people mess up. They, they keep on dividing by 14, or maybe they divide by the observed instead of the expected. What you need to do is divide by the expected. So we divide four, 49 by 10 and you would get 4.9. Next one, observe 14 minus the expected of 21 you would get negative seven, we square it up, we get 49. You would divide by the expected, not the observed, so we're dividing by 21. And when you divide 49 by 21, you get what? 2.3. Good, 2.3. And then the last cell, the observed is 21. Subtract it by 14, we get seven, we square that up, we get 49. We take the expected of 14, and we get 3.5. So we've done this four times already, okay? For each four cells. The next thing we do is we add these up, and 3.5 plus 4.9 plus 2.3 plus 3.5 should add up to what? 14.2. 14.2, good. So our chi-square is equal to 14.2. Anybody have any questions about how we calculate the chi-square? No. I got it? Cool. All right, so that's how you go about calculating the chi-square. Okay, so now that we have the chi-square statistic, what we need to do is we need to take that chi-square and then compare it with our chi-square distribution. So the chi-square distribution is somewhat similar to the T distribution that we learned about a few weeks ago. So the sampling distribution of the chi tells the probability of getting values of the chi-square, assuming no relationship exists in the population, okay? What does that mean? That sounds like some textbook jargon, okay? So what that's telling you is that it tells you the probability of pulling, um, of pulling these observed frequencies, assuming the null hypothesis is true. Assuming no relationship exists in the population, what's the probability of us pulling these observed frequencies? Okay, pulling these observed frequencies when we know the expected frequencies are different. What's the probability of pulling, you know, a sample data where 21 males said no, when it should have been 14 males? 
what's the probability of pulling sample data where three males said yes when it should have been 10 males, right? So our observed frequencies are quite different from our expected frequencies, which suggests, this, this sample data suggests that there's actual relationship in the actual population. So we can think about the distribution of the chi as kind of providing us with a p-value for this sample data. What's the probability of pulling this sample, assuming no, no, no relationship exists, and assuming that no hypothesis is true, okay? Now, if the probability is sufficiently low enough, then we reject the null hypothesis, okay? And what do we mean by sufficiently low enough? We mean if the probability is below that 0 0.05, 0 0.01, or 0 0.001 alpha level, okay? Now, the chi-square distribution, similar to the t, t distribution, is not one distribution. It is a family of distributions or a family of curves that again is determined by its degrees of freedom, okay? Um, the the chi-square distribution is always gonna be a positively skewed distribution. If you remember what I uh, said earlier, um, there's no mean, right? So because there's no mean, there's no below the mean. So there's no left side, there's no left tailed test, there's no left side of the distribution in that sense. So the chi-square test is always going to be a one-tailed, a right-tailed test, okay? And the chi-square distribution is always going to be a right-tailed, positively skewed distribution because of the fact that the chi-square number can only go up. It can't go down. It can't go below a mean. So it's not going to be symmetrical like the normal distribution or the T distribution because with nominal and or ordinal level data, we don't have that type of like distribution because our data doesn't work like that, okay? Now the chi-square, the absolute smallest value you can get for the chi-square is zero. There is no maximum or upper limit to the chi-square value. Now the chi-square, if it's zero, what do you think our observed frequencies look like in, to, in relation to our expected? If we have a chi-square which is equal to zero, are the observed frequencies close to the expected frequencies or are they far away from the expected frequency? If our chi-square is zero, are the observed frequencies gonna be close to the expected frequencies or are they gonna be different from the expected frequencies. Uh. Y'all can guess. Are they different if it's zero? No, they're actually going to be the exact same number. So if we end up with a chi-square value, which is equal to zero, what that means is that the observed frequencies and the expected frequencies are the exact same number. So the observed for males who said no would be 14, the expected would for uh, no, males who said no would be 14, so it'd be 14 minus 14 would give you zero, square that zero up, you'd get zero, divide that zero by the expected frequency, you still get zero. So what that means is that if you get a chi-square value which is equal to zero, there is no difference between the observed and the expected frequencies, which means that in all likelihood, the null hypothesis is true, that there is no relationship between the two variables in the population, okay? Um, now, if our chi-square is really, really big, what that means is that there is a pretty big difference between the observed frequencies and the expected frequencies. So it's typically the case, although it's not quite this simple, but it's typically the case that the larger our chi-square value is, the more likely we are to be able to reject the null hypothesis. And the larger our chi-square value is, okay, the further our observed frequencies are away from our expected frequencies, okay? 
So again, a, a, a small chi-square value ideally is not what we want. We want a relatively large chi-square value because the larger the value, the more likely we are to reject the null hypothesis. Another thing about the chi-square distribution is that as our number of degrees of freedom increases, the chi-square distribution becomes more and more symmetrical, but understand that the chi-square distribution is always going to be a positively skewed distribution. Right? So similar to the T, distribution as the number the degrees of freedom increase the t distribution started to look more and more normal in a similar way as our degrees of freedom increases the chi-square distribution starts to look more symmetrical so with one degree of freedom it's an extremely skewed distribution five degrees of freedom is still a pretty skewed distribution but as your degrees of freedom increases the distribution becomes more and more symmetrical how do we go about calculating the degrees of freedom? It's actually a pretty simple calculation. What you're gonna do is you're gonna take how many rows you have, you're gonna subtract by one. You're gonna take how many columns you have. Columns are the vertical ones, the rows are the horizontal ones. You're gonna take how many columns you have and you're gonna subtract by one. You get those two numbers and then you're going to multiply them together. Then you get your degrees of freedom. What is our degrees of freedom for this cross tab? Two. It is one. One. Because, uh, let me do it up here. So we know we have degrees of freedom is equal to row minus one times column minus row. How many rows do we have? Two. two. How many columns do we have? Two. two, right? Two minus one gives us one. Two minus one gives us one. One times one gives us one so we have one degree of freedom okay so we know that our chi-square value our chi-square statistic is 14.2 our degrees of freedom is equal to one so now that we have these pieces of information what we now need to do is we need to go to page 380 of the current edition on which is the distribution of the chi so it's appendix d it's right after the distribution of the t Okay, now the appendix D is going to look different than the T distribution. And it's also going to look different than the normal distribution as well. Okay, so what you're going to look at first is on the left column, you're going to see the degrees of freedom. Okay, now you're going to find the degrees of freedom as closest to the number that you have. Okay, so if you have one degree of freedom, you're going to look in the first row, one degree of freedom, one. Then what you're going to do is you're going to see at the top, you're going to see the alpha levels. Okay, now like I said, we're going to be using 0 0.05, 0 0.01, and 0 0.001. Okay, so what we're going to be doing is for one degree of freedom, let's just take a look at the 0 0.05 alpha level. For one degree of freedom and a 0 0.05 alpha level, what number do we see there? For one degree of, what? 3.8. 3.841, good, okay. Now that is our critical value, okay. So it's referred to as the chi critical. So the critical value we're trying to get either at or above. So our critical value for the 0 0.05 alpha level is 3.841. Is equal to 3 If our chi-square statistic is either at or above this critical value, we reject the null hypothesis, okay? If it is below this critical value, we fail to reject the null hypothesis, okay? So given a chi-square of 14.2 with one degree of freedom and a chi-critical of 3.841, do we reject or do we fail to reject the null hypothesis? Fail to reject? Mm, uh, so remember, 
this is our chi-square statistic, which is 14.2. And so what we're trying to do, we're trying to get this number, our chi-square statistic, either, let's just say this is our chi-critical, this is our chi-square stati statistic, we're trying to get this number either at or above this value. If it's either at or above, we reject the null hypothesis. If our chi-square statistic is below the chi-critical, we fail to reject. Okay, so since we know that this number is bigger than this number, what do we do? Do we reject the null hypothesis or do we fail to reject? We reject. We reject. Good. Okay. So that's for the 0 0.05 alpha level. Now for the 0 0.01 alpha level, what number do we see here? 6.635. Uh, 6.635. Mm -hmm. 6 yeah. What do we do? Do we reject or do we fail to reject? We reject. That we reject. And then for the 0 0.001 alpha level, uh, what is our chi critical? 10.827. Okay, so again, do we reject or do we fail to reject? Reject. We reject. Good. So, because obviously this number is bigger than this number. So, as long as this number is either at or bigger or at or above this number, we reject. If it's below, we fail to reject. Okay. Now, having said that, so we made our decision, okay, so we can reject the null hypothesis, okay, we can reject the idea that in the population that we're looking at, we can reject the idea that sex and fear of walking alone at night are independent. So we're rejecting this idea that um, sex doesn't influence whether or not you're afraid to walk alone at night, okay. Now, the reason why we're rejecting it is because with a chi-square statistic that high, what we're saying is that if we can reject at the 0 0.05 alpha level, what that means is if we were to have taken 100 samples, 100 random samples with an N of 59, where we have, uh, where in the population, sex has no influence on whether or not you're afraid to walk alone at night, we were to have taken 100 of those samples. Only five out of those 100 samples would have observed frequencies that much different from the expected frequencies, okay? So the probability of pulling these observed frequencies, assuming the null hypothesis is true, if we can reject the 0.05 alpha level, is five in 100 chance, okay? If we can reject at the 0.01 alpha level, the probability of us pulling these observed frequencies, assuming the null hypothesis is true, assuming it's coming from a population where sex has no influence on fear, if we can reject the 0 0.01 alpha level, there's only a one in a hundred chance of that happening. So if we were to have taken a hundred samples from a population where sex has no influence on whether or not you're afraid to walk alone at night, only one out of those hundred samples would have observe frequencies that much different from the expected frequencies. Okay. And again, if we can reject at the 0 0.001 alpha level, what we're saying is that if we were to have taken a thousand random samples from a population where sex has no influence on fear of walking alone at night, that only one out of those 1,000 samples would have observed frequencies that much different from the expected frequencies, okay? Now, one in 1,000 is so unlikely, is so improbable, so we're just gonna reject the idea that this sample data, that these observed frequencies came from a population where sex has no influence on fear. So that provides support for our research hypothesis that sex does influence fear in the population, okay? Does that make sense, people? Cool. All um, right, so we're here, and then uh, let's see what time it is. Uh, we still got some time. So let's talk about some of the limitations of the chi-square before we take a break, okay? So one of the limitations of the chi-square uh, test is that it does not give us much information about the strength of the relationship. Now, you might say to yourself, well, what do you mean by it doesn't give us any information about the strength of the relationship, okay? Now, what we're saying is that 
it's extremely unlikely for us to have pulled these observations, these observed frequencies, assuming the null hypothesis is true. So we're saying that sex does influence whether or not you're afraid to walk alone at night. We're, that's what the calculator tells us. In all likelihood, this data came from a population where sex influences whether or not you're afraid to walk alone at night. But what it doesn't tell us, what the chi-square doesn't tell us, is it doesn't tell us how well sex predicts whether or not you're afraid to walk alone at night. So it doesn't tell us the strength of the association, how well being a male or a female is going to predict whether or not you're going to say yes or no. So it doesn't tell us the strength of the association. It just tells us that there is an association, if that makes sense to people. Does that make sense to people? It doesn't tell you how strong the association is, but it, does, but it tells you that, there's a, that there is an association, that there is a relationship. Does that make sense? It's it's a tricky. Okay, okay so I, I guess one way to think about it is, we're if we're if we're if we're rejecting the null, we're definitely saying sex influences whether or not you're afraid to walk alone at night. So we're saying, yeah, in all likelihood, that's definitely the case. But how, how well does it predict whether or not you're gonna say yes or no? So I'm a male, so in all likelihood, I'm gonna say, no, I'm not afraid to walk alone at night, right? But is every male gonna say no, or is like only some of the males gonna say no, right? Are only some of the males gonna say no, right? So we're gonna say that a higher proportion or a higher percentage of males are gonna say no, but how much of a higher percentage of males? Is it slightly higher percentage than, than females? Or is it gonna be a way higher percentage, right? And that's one of the things that the chi-square does not tell us. It's gonna tell us that a higher percentage of males are gonna say no, but it's not gonna tell us how high a percentage, right? So it doesn't tell us just how strong that relationship and just how strong that association is. So that's what it means by it tells us that there is a relationship, but it doesn't tell us the strength or its significance in the population, okay? Now, another problem with the chi-square test is that it's sensitive to sample size, okay? How sensitive the sample size is to chi-square test? Well, it's actually directly proportional, proportionate to the size of the sample. Now, and that's of course independent of the strength of the relationship between the two variables. What does that mean? So what does that mean? So let's just say we go back to this data. Let's just say that we look at males who say no, let's just say we double it from 21 to 42. Look at males who say yes, we double it from 30 to 6. Look at females who say no, 14, we double it to 28. We look at females who say yes, 21, we double it from 21 to 42. Okay. What's going to happen to our chi-square? It's not going to be 14.2 anymore. It's going to be exactly double that, which means it's going to be 28.4. So that's what we mean by it's directly proportionate to the size of the sample. You double the size of the sample and, and you double everything else. You don't change the strength of the association at all. It's going to double the size of the chi-square. The, the exact opposite is true as well. We take the males who say no, there's 21. We divide that by two, we get 10.5, so we cut it in half. We take the males who say yes, three, we divide that in half, 1.5. Take females who say no, it's 14 right now, we take it to seven. We take females who say yes, it's 21, we take it to 10.5. What we just did is we just cut our sample size in half from 59 to 29.5. What happened to our chi-square? It went from 14.2 to 7.1. So that's what we mean by the um, chi-square test is extremely sensitive to sample size. So obviously one of the ways to reject the null hypothesis, and this is a big problem with the chi-square, increase your sample size, and it's gonna be a lot easier to reject the null. Okay, because of the fact that there's such a huge limitation with this, in the sense that chi-square is so sensitive to sample size, um, we, when we calculate the chi-square, we're typically, well, we're, we're almost always going to calculate, unless there's some, unless you're just doing homework or something like that, you're, you're gonna calculate the measures of association with the chi-square, okay? 
So what is a measure of association? So the measure enables us to use a single summarizing measure or number for analyzing the relationship between the two variables. Textbook jargon, what does that mean? The measure of association tells you the strength of the relationship. So chi-squared tells you that a relationship exists, while the measure of association tells you how strong that relationship is how good of a predictor the, it is the independent variable for the dependent variable. So again, um, as you see with the second bullet point, the measure tells us the strength of the relationship and at times the direction. And what do I mean by at times is if you have ordinal level data, it'll give you positive or negative. Again, with positive relationships, the two variables, they vary in the same direction. With negative or inverse relationships, the two variables go in the opposite direction, okay? So if you have ordinal level data, it can tell you direction. If you have ordinal or what we refer to as dichotomous nominal, it can also tell you direction. Well, we're gonna do what a dichotomous nominal variable is coming up, okay? Now, in this chapter, we're gonna talk about measures of association for both nominal and ordinal variables, okay? Now, we're gonna discuss lambda, and Kramer's V for nominal level data. So if you have nominal variables, you're gonna use lambda and Kramer's V. And if you have ordinal level variables, you're gonna use gamma, okay? So gamma is a measure of association for ordinal level variables. Lambda and Kramer's V is a measure of association for nominal level variables. I've been talking a lot. Does anybody have any questions about this? This is, this will be something you're gonna be tested on. So this is just kind of something you need to memorize. Lambda, Kramer, Vs for nominal variables, gamma for ordinal level variables. Good. Okay, now the idea that underlies uh, the, almost all measures of association is something we refer to as the proportional reduction of error. So I'm going to give you all a break because this is a little confusing to some people right after I go over this slide. Um, but I just want to go over this just so we can like at least, I can at least expose you all of this. Okay? So a proportional reduction of error, okay, what you're doing is you're comparing the errors made in predicting the dependent variable while ignoring the independent variable with the errors made when, predi when making predictions that use information about the independent variable. Okay. And in fact, it's probably isn't gonna make sense until I show you how to do it. So it's 6.35, why don't we go ahead and take a 20 minute break. Uh, actually, let's go ahead and take a 20, let's go ahead and take a 20 minute break. Let's come back at 6.56. Uh, right, let's come back at 6.56 and we'll discuss how to calculate the measures of association. Sounds good.
All right, y'all ready to get back to it? Sir. All right, let's do it. Um, yeah, let me check this. Okay, so what question did you have? Okay, so the, the expected, expected frequency for Mel saying no was 21. Mm, no, so what we do is we take that 24, right? So we take the, that's the observed frequency. So what you're looking at right here are observed frequencies, right? So 21 is the observed, and then uh, what you do is you take the 24, so the column total, 24. No, I, I went wrong, I see, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Any other question before we uh, get back to the lecture? Okay, so I think when we last left off, we were talking about the proportional reduction of error. Okay. And the proportional reduction of error, what we're doing here is we are trying to compare the amount of errors or prediction that we make when we ignore the independent variable to the amount of errors of prediction we make when we use the independent variable, right? Now, the idea being is that if you make less pre prediction errors using the independent variable than when you don't use the independent variable, um, the independent variable helps you predict the value of the dependent variable, which means it tells you the strength of the association, okay? Now, this is a lot of textbook jargon. I really don't think you can understand it until I show you how to do it, okay? So like I said, all measures of association uh, are based upon this whole concept of the PRU or the proportional reduction of error. Um, so again, according to the PRE, two variables are associated when information about one, which is the independent variable, could help us improve our prediction of the other. Okay, so the formula for calculating the PRE is E1 minus E2 divided by E1, okay? Now, E1 are the errors of prediction made when the independent variable is ignored. And E2 are the errors of prediction made when the prediction is based on the independent variable. Again, it still might not make a lot of sense. So like I said, when we do it together, it'll hopefully make more sense. So let's take a look at this, okay? Now I'm gonna walk you through step by step what you need to do. We're looking at a cross tab here, which we've been doing for the past two chapters. And I want you to tell me which variable, so there's two variables, number of children, and, and the second variable is whether or not you support abortion, right? Which one is the independent variable and which one is the dependent variable? Number of children is Independent variable and independent variable is supporting of abortion. Yeah. Good. Good. So the independent variable is the number of children. That's what we have in the column. Dependent variables in the row, which is support for abortion for any reason. Right? And the two options are yes and no. Okay. Now, if you remember what E1 is, E1 are the errors of prediction made when the independent variable is ignored. So since we know that the independent variable is number of children, what we're looking at is none or one child or two or more children. Okay. And since E1 is, we're ignoring the independent variable, I'm gonna take those two columns, none or one child, two or more children, the 36, the 23, the 59, the 15, the 31, the 46, I'm gonna completely ignore everything in the middle. And what I'm looking at, I am just looking at support for abortion for any reason, yes or no. Then I'm gonna look at the row totals, 51, 54, and then the N, which is 105. So if you remember from last week's lecture, the row totals or the row marginals, it, it's essentially the frequency distribution of the dependent variable, okay? So if I just look at the row totals, I am just looking at the dependent variable, okay? And I'm ignoring the independent variable. Does that make sense to everybody? Because if I was in class, I'd be like, I'd just be blocking, I'd be trying to like stand in front of the number of children and I'd be just trying to pretend like, hey, just don't even look at this. So don't look at the middle section. We're just looking at support for abortion for any reason, yes or no, and we're looking at the row totals, 51, 54, and we're looking at the end of 105. 
that's all we want to look at when we're doing E1. Does that make sense to people? We're ignoring the whole middle because that the middle is the independent variable. And we want to ignore that because E1 are the errors of prediction made when we ignore the independent variable. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah, can you go back yeah. to that last slide? Go back this slide? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so again, E1 are the errors of prediction made when the independent variable is ignored. So when I'm looking at the cross tab, what I want to do is I want to ignore the independent variable. Okay, I want to ignore the whole none or one child or two or more children because that's the information with the independent variable. I want to pretend that doesn't exist. I'm just going to block it out of my mind. Okay, so I'm just looking at the row totals here. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to predict whether or not people are going to say yes or whether or not people say no. Okay. Um, and I just want to ask y'all, Based upon that, would you all predict that people would say yes? They support abortion for any reason, or would you, would you predict they say no? They don't support abortion. I would feel abortion. very confident either way. Yeah. Okay, but let's just say that uh, you had to predict. Would you predict that they say yes or no? I mean, I know it's really close, right? So any prediction that you're going to make is, is going to be off, off to some degree, right? Well, the way I would predict it, I would say people would say no. Now, why would I predict no? Because more people said no than said yes. Okay. So I would predict that people would say no because there's just a higher percentage and there's a higher frequency. So having predicted that people say uh, they support abortion for any reason uh, and then they would say no, when I made that prediction, I made a series of errors, right? I, I made some errors. Now, when I predicted that everybody in the sample said no, how many errors did I make? 51. 51, good. So my E1 is equal to 51. E1 is equal to 51. So if you're wondering, how do you go about predicting? The way you go about predicting is you find the modal category. Now, what is the modal category? If you remember what the mode is, it's the category that occurs most frequent. Okay, It's the category with the largest number. Since no had a larger number than yes, 54 people said no. 51 people said yes. I'm going to predict the mode. The mode is no. The mode is no, and when I predicted people would say no, I made 51 errors. Does that make sense to people how I got E1? Yeah. Anybody have any questions about that? Good, All right? People cut onto that a little bit quicker than I thought they would. Now, what I wanna do next is to calculate E2. Now, what is E2? Now, E2, are the errors of prediction made when the prediction is based on the independent variable. So last time, what we did is we took that none or one child, we pretended it, it, it didn't exist. We took the two or more children, we pretended it didn't exist. This time, what we're gonna do is we're still gonna predict the value of the dependent variable, but this time we're gonna use the independent variable. There are two categories to the independent variable, none or one child, two or more children. What I'm gonna do first off to predict E2, calculate E2, is I'm gonna say, look at just people who have none or one child. And I'm gonna to try to predict whether or not they're gonna say yes or no. And which one would I predict? Would I predict that they say yes or would I predict they say no? Yes. Okay, why would I predict that they say yes? Because 36 over 23, the odds are in their favor. Right, so the odds are in their favor. 36 is the, or yes is the modal category because 36 is higher than 23. Now, when I predicted that everybody who has none or one child is going to say yes, how many errors did I make? 23. 23. Good. Now, I'm not done now because there's another category, right? People who have two or more children. 
for people who have two or more children, am I going to predict that they say yes or am I going to predict that they say no? I'm going to predict they say no. I'm going to predict that they say no. And the reason why I'm going to predict that they say no is because 31 people said no in that category. That's the modal category. So that's higher than 15. Good. And when I predicted that people would say no if they have two or more children, how many errors did I make? 15. 15. Which gives me 23 plus 15 gives me an E2, which is equal to 38. Does everybody see how I calculated E1 and E2? Can, can you tell me again, E2, please? Let's go back to it. OK, so I, I want you to talk to me, Beatrice. Um, so number of children, there's two categories, right? Yeah. What are those two categories? The first one is not or one child, and the second one is two or more children. Good. Now let's just take a look at none or one child. Um, if we were looking at just none or one child, would we predict that those, those people would say yes, they support abortion, or would we predict that they say no, they don't support abortion? You said yes, because it's the, the number is major. It's, it's bigger. Right. So 36 is bigger than 23. Now, when I predicted that everybody who has none or one child says yes, I made some errors because everybody didn't who has none or one child didn't say yes. Some people said no. So how many errors did I make? How many people said no? 23. 23. So then I started off with 23. Now I do that exact same process with the people who have two or more children. So for the people who have two or more children, would I predict that they say yes or would I predict that they say no? They're going to say no because it's 31 is the bigger number. Right, and then when I, when I said that everybody who has two or more children are going to say no, how many errors did I make? 15. 15, so I take that 23, right, for the first category. I add that to the 15 from the second category, and I get that 38. So that's how I got E2, 38. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah, and then E1 is like, like I said, pretty much the same process. You, you, you predict the mode, then the errors are what's left over, okay? So now that I got E1 and E2, why don't y'all go ahead and calculate the PRE, which is, if y'all remember from that formula, is um, E1 minus E2 divided by E1. So why don't y'all go ahead and calculate PR, the PRE for me. Uh, point two five four nine. Um, may maybe did, did everybody else get that? Yeah, point twenty five. Yeah, I got the same thing. All right, cool. So let's go ahead and do that together. So we know that E one is fifty one minus thirty eight, and then E one is again fifty one. So we do fifty one minus thirty eight gives us. 13, right? Thirteen divided by fifty-one gives us, I guess, point two five, right? Zero point two five four nine. All right, so we'll just go with uh, point two five. So the PRE, proportional reduction of error, is equal to point two five. Now that tells us how well the independent variable predicts the value of the dependent variable. It tells us the strength of the relationship. Okay. Now, I'm going to show you a chart that helps you to determine, you know, what number is a strong, which number is a moderate, which number is a weak relationship. Um, can y'all see this uh, PowerPoint again? Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay. So, we just calculated the PRE for here. We know it's 0.25, okay? Now that you know this 0.25, you might say to yourself, okay, well, what does 0.25 tell me? Is it a weak relationship? Is it a strong relationship? Is it a 
moderate relationship. So the PRE is a number that can range from zero to either positive 1.0 or negative 1.0. Now, if it's a positive 1.0, or if it's a positive number, you know that it's a positive relationship or a direct relationship. If it's a negative number, then you know it's a negative or inverse relationship. Inverse meaning as one variable goes up, the other one goes down. Positive meaning as one variable goes up, the other one goes up. As one variable goes down, the other one goes down. Okay. Now, a PRE of zero means that there's no association between the two variables whatsoever. So the independent variable doesn't help you predict the value of the dependent variable at all. Okay. Now, if you have a situation where you have a PRE of like 1.0, this is a perfect relationship where the independent variable perfectly predicts the value of the dependent variable. So a good example of like a PRE of one would be, let's just say that you pull 59 people, right? Let's just say we know that 24 of them are males, 35 of them are females. And then you ask the sample of respondents, are you afraid to walk alone tonight? Let's just say every single male said no, and every single female said yes. Well, that would be a PRE of 1.0 because being a male or a female perfectly predicts whether or not you're going to say yes or no. Okay. Now, seeing something like a perfect 1.0 is just extremely unlikely in the social sciences. Similar to seeing like a perfect 0.0 is extremely unlikely in the social sciences. In all likelihood, you're going to see something like a 0.25. You're going to see some gradation in between 0 and 1.0. Because you're going to see some type of gradation, how do you determine whether or not it's a weak, moderate, strong, so on? Okay, what you're going to do is, like I said, if you have a PRE of zero, it is no relationship at all. If it's 0.20, it's a weak relationship. If it's 0.40, it's moderate. If it's 0.60, it's strong. If it's 0 0.80, it's a very strong. And if you have 1.0, it's a perfect relationship. Okay. Now, obviously, if you see negative 0.20, it's a weak negative relationship because you have an inverse association between the two variables, okay? Now, one thing that we, about our 0.25, now you might think to yourself, okay, well, it's a weak relationship, but you wouldn't report it as a weak relationship because it's in between 0 0.20 and 0 0.40, you would refer to it as a weak to moderate relationship. Okay, so it is not just a weak relationship, nor is it a moderate, because it's technically closer to weak. You say it's a weak to moderate relationship. So if it's anywhere in between 0 0.20 and 0 0.40, it's weak to moderate. If it's anywhere in between 0 0.40 and 0 0.60, then it'd be moderate to strong, and so on and so forth. Okay, um, does that make sense to people? So we don't have a weak relationship here with this 0.25. We have a weak to moderate relationship with this 0.25. Yep. Okay, good. Now, you wouldn't technically say that it's a weak to moderate. Uh, well, I guess you could say it's a positive relationship, but typically the whole positive and negative is reserved for ordinal level data. Um, but because these two variables are dichotomous nominal, you can kind of treat them as ordinal in that sense. I'll talk about what we mean by dichotomous uh, coming up. Okay, so like I said, um, that PRE underlies all these measures of association, the lambda, Kramer Z, gamma, things like that. Okay, now the first one, lambda is for nominal level variables. Kramer's V is also for a nominal level variable. Um, it's for a nominal level variable when uh, lambda doesn't work, you're going to default to Kramer's V. Okay, sometimes lambda doesn't work, and I'll explain why. Gamma. You're going to use that if you have either ordinal level variables, if you have two ordinal level variables, or if you have dichotomous nominal variables. Okay. So again, lambda is an asymmetrical measure of association and it's suitable for use with nominal variables. It can range from zero to one. Now, because of the fact that lambda is for nominal level variables, there's no negative number because with nominal you don't have direction so you're never going to have like a negative relationship it's always just going to be a positive number okay now what do i mean by asymmetrical measure of association what that means let's just say i calculate lambda i have my independent variable and let's just jump back to this data that we just used 
My independent variable is the number of children, and then my dependent variable is whether or not you support whether or not you support abortion for any reason. Okay. Now let's just say I take these two numbers, I flip them around. So support for abortion is the independent variable. The number of children you have is the dependent variable. The lambda that I'm going to get is going to be a different number. Okay, so that's what we mean by asymmetrical. If you flip, if you take the independent variable and the dependent variable, you flip them around, you're going to get a different lambda. You're going to get a different number. Does that make sense to people? So that's what we mean by asymmetrical. So basically, if you uh, flip flop the independent and dependent variables, the numbers are going to be different. Yes. Okay. So that's, yeah. That's that's what we mean by asymmetrical. Right. Okay. So it's important when you're calculating lambda that you specify which one's the independent variable and which one's the dependent variable because your lambda is going to change depending on you know if you if you flip them around. Okay. Um, now, like I said, lambda is a PRE measure of association. It follows the same basic formula as the PRE that we just discussed. It is E1 minus E2 divided by E1. Up at the top of the screen uh, where you see that lambda, and it looks like a really, really weird kind of like, I guess you can kind of say an up upside down Y. That is the mathematical notation for lambda. It's another Greek letter, so it looks something like this that is lambda now um why don't y'all go ahead and calculate do y'all think that y'all can calculate lambda using this data does anybody here think that they can pull this one off Yes. Well, let's all go ahead and try to calculate lambda right now. Same thing, find E1, 2, find E2, plug it into that E1 minus E2 divided by E1, and then you get your uh, lambda. With the last example we did, it was like, you're basically choosing on the row totals on the side. Mm -hmm. what, like choosing yes or no, what's the right, what's the right way to, to go? And then your remainder would be the errors. But in this situation, it's satisfied more or less or not satisfied. So what am I looking for? You're just looking for the biggest number, which would be your mode. You'd predict that. And then your remainder is what's left over, right? So just tell me, which is, what's, what's the modal category? here 131 which is more or less more or less good so we predicted that people are going to say more or less right so yeah. what's left over uh, 22 and 68 which gives us 190 that's your e1 it's a good okay. question so again you have to take the mode then add up the other two numbers together now you're gonna to have to do that for the independent variable to find e2 as well so now that you already got e1 we, we just said it is 190 now you all need to go find E2 for both. Um, you need to do it to find E2 for both own and you need to do it for red and then add them together to get E2. I don't understand.
Does anybody have uh, the answer or what they think is the answer? Well, I mean, your math is pulled up on the screen that you're sharing. So like I can see it, but I don't even understand how you got those numbers for E2. Like I'm kind of, I'm lost at how you uh, chose. Well, we can certainly do that together. Oh, so you're seeing uh, the one where it shows not just the slide, but the next slide, right? Yeah, but I mean, like, it's helpful because I understand what I'm looking for, but I'm also, like, not understanding, like, if if what we pulled out was, um, I, I don't know, I'll, just, I'll let you go through it, I guess. All right, let's do it together. All right, so we already got 190. Did everybody understand how we got E1 with the 190? Uh, you subtracted 392 by the highest row total? 392, no. All right, so let's just take a look at this PowerPoint. All right, so we know we're looking at, um, so home ownership is the independent variable, so the own and rent, we're, we're just going to ignore that, okay, because we're going to ignore the independent variable. So we're just looking at financial satisfaction, satisfied, more or less not satisfied, and we're looking at the row totals, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the row totals and I want to find the modal category. Now, the modal category is just a category that occurs most often, the most frequent, the biggest number. So when you're looking at the row total, what's the biggest number there? 131. 131. Everybody still with me? Yeah. Cool. So what we do is we're going to predict that everybody's going to say that they're more or less satisfied. Okay. And when I predicted that, I made errors because everybody didn't say more or less satisfied. Some people said satisfied, some people said not satisfied. So what I need to do is look at how many errors that I made and how many errors did I make? 190. 190 because 122 people said that they're satisfied and 68 said they're not satisfied. 122 plus 68 equals 190. Everybody understand how we got E1? Yes. Yes. Good. Okay, now what I'm going to do is now that I have E1, I need to find E2. So I'm going to do this exact same process, except instead of looking at the row totals, I'm going to look at the independent variable. There's two categories. There's own and then there's rent. Okay. Can you, uh, can you let us see the, white, the whiteboard? Uh, sure. Um, You're writing. I'm sorry. I wasn't writing all that. It's oh. just kind of, kind of a lot of write to write. Um, but... I could write it here if y'all want. Um, so we could um, own we have own rent row total of we have I'm gonna put sat set aside m O L for more or less, and then N S is not satisfied. Then I put C T for column total. Okay, so we know we have Okay, so what we did for the first one to get E1, so I'm going to put E1 up here. What we did is we looked at the row total, so this RT is row total. We knew that this is the mode, so we predicted more or less, people are going to say more or less, when we made that prediction, we made 122 plus 68 errors, gives us E1, which is 190 errors when we ignore the independent variable. Now we're using the independent variable, so there's two. There's two categories, own and then rent. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the people who own. 
and we're going to predict whether or not they're going to say that they're satisfied, more or less, or not, satis not satisfied. And are we going to predict that they say satisfied, more or less, or not satisfied? Satisfied. Satisfied. And the reason why is because the satisfied 104 is the biggest number. Now, when I made that prediction, how many errors did I make? 135. 135. So I take this 85 plus this 50 together, I get B2 is equal to 135. But I'm not done. And the reason why I'm not done is because I've only done it for own so far. What I also need to do is for rent. Now, for renters, am I going to predict that the renter says that they're satisfied, more or less, or not satisfied? More or less. I'm going to predict that they say more or less because this number is the biggest number, right? It's the most. Now, when I predicted that everybody whose renters said that they're more or less satisfied, how many errors did I make? 128. 36. 36. 18 plus 18 gives me 36. So my E2 is equal to 171. 171. Everybody get that? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Now that we know that we have our E1, we have our E2. 190 is E1. 171 is E2. We're going to go ahead and plug this into that formula. So our formula is E1 minus E2 divided by E1. So we have lambda is equal to 190 minus 171 divided by 190. So 190 minus 171, 19. So we're going to have 19 divided by 190. And then you know that your lambda is equal to 0.10 which means our lambda, if you remember from that chart, is a, we see that it's a very, it's a weak relationship between these two variables. Um, does anybody have any questions about how we did that? Like I said, I know it's a lot of stuff just being thrown at you, right? My only question is why is the formula for calculating lambda the same as the formula for calculating PRE? That's just the way it works. That's just the way lambda, that's lambda's formula. I mean, you have to ask the person who came up with that calculation. Not gonna, I really have no better answer for you than that. I'm not going to lie to you. Okay. It's just weird that it's called two different things and it's the exact same formula. Well, well, proportional reduction of error is this general idea of what we're trying to do is we're trying to predict um, the value of the dependent variable while ignoring the independent variable. Okay. And then um, obviously then compare those errors with the errors of prediction made when you use the independent variable. So there's a couple different PRE formulas out there. That, what we just showed is, was one of them. Um, and uh, it just so happens to be the exact same formula as the lambda formula. Okay, so is it more accurate to say that lambda is one form of a PRE formula? Yes, yes, yes. And then we're gonna learn about gamma coming up too, which is another uh, proportional reduction error formula. Now, yeah, so there's, so there's a few of them, yeah. But like the whole idea of the E1 minus E2 divided by E1, that underlies all the proportional reduction of error formulas. So it underlies all the measures of association. Okay, I understand now. Yeah, that's actually a good question. All right, so now that we got that, we know how to calculate uh, lambda. What I'm going to do is uh, I told you that sometimes we use Kramer's V when lambda doesn't work, and I'm going to show you why lambda doesn't always work. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the way I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna use similar numbers, but I'm gonna make them a little different. 18 here, I'm gonna put 46 here. Okay, now what we have here is I'm gonna recalculate uh, lambda and I'm just gonna do it really, really quick, okay? So what we do is we're gonna ignore the independent variable. We're just gonna look at the row totals. What's the most, satisfied more or less or not satisfied? 
satisfied, right? Because that's the biggest number. When I predicted that people are going to say that they're satisfied, how many errors are predicted that I make? 103 plus 68 gives me 171. So our E1 is equal to 171. Now, um, I'm going to do this for each category of the independent variable. I'm going to look at own first. Am I going to predict satisfied more or less or not satisfied? I'm going to predict satisfied because that's the biggest number. But I add 85 plus 50 is going to give me 135. So E2 equal to 135. I'm going to do this for rent. Am I going to predict satisfied more or less or not satisfied? I'm going to predict satisfied because this is the biggest number. 18 plus 18 gives me 36 which is going to give me an E2 equal to 171. Probably doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure this out. E1 is 171, E2 is 171. E1 minus E2, 171 minus 171 gives us zero, divided by 171 gives me a lambda, which is equal to zero, okay? What happened here? Now, sometimes lambda doesn't work. Sometimes even if there is a relationship between two variables, lambda will give you a zero, even if there is a relationship. Now, why would lambda do that? The reason why that happens with lambda is what we have here, the modal category. Each time for both categories of the independent variable, for owners, it's satisfied. For renters, it's satisfied as well. When you have a situation where the mode is the same category for each category of the independent variable, then lambda is always going to be zero and lambda is not going to work. And so even if there is an association between the two variables, lambda won't show you that. Lambda will just say that it's zero. So, I, so there's situations where there's clearly a relationship between the two variables. But then when you calculate lambda, it says zero. And the reason why it says zero is because the modal category is the same category of the, uh, for the dependent variable, the same category for each category, the independent variable. So for owners, the modal category is satisfied. For renters in this example, the modal category is satisfied and your lambda is always gonna end up zero in that situation. When that happens, lambda is no longer an appropriate measure of association. And what you're gonna wanna do is use an alternate, alternate measure of association. And you are going to want to, well, let's just talk about some other just theoretical stuff about lambda. So like I said, when, when you're calculating lambda, the numbers change depending on which one you specify as the independent variable, which one you specify as the dependent variable, because as I stated already, lambda is asymmetrical. So you need to make sure that when you're calculating lambda, you specify this one's the independent variable, the independent variable's in the column, this one's the dependent variable, the dependent variable's in the row, okay? So, and then you're probably gonna be tested on this, so I would suggest you, you memorize that lambda is asymmetrical. Now, like I said, lambda doesn't always work. So when lambda doesn't work, what you're gonna to wanna to do is you're gonna use Kramer's V, okay? Now, the way you go about calculating Kramer's V is it's based on the value of the chi-square. It can range from zero to one, as I stated already, you know, um, Kramer's V, you're gonna be using this for nominal level data. So because it's nominal, you're not gonna have any negatives because there's no direction and there's no order to the categories of nominal variables. Um, now, um, if it's the Kramer's V of zero, there's no association. If it's one, it's a perfect association or perfect relationship. Now, how do you go about calculating Kramer's V? Kramer's V, this is the formula, okay. And, um, to show how to calculate Kramer's V, we're gonna use the chi-square that we used earlier. So I want y'all to feed me what those numbers were. So to calculate Kramer's V, let's use that chi-square that we used earlier, is equal to the square root of the chi-square. Does anybody remember what the chi-square is that, that we used? I'll remember that. Uh, 14.2. Good, 14.2. Now, um, the end, does anybody remember what the end was for that data? Mm 
59. And then the M. Now, the this is, I didn't create this slide. This textbook created this slide. Okay. Um, M is the smaller of the row, plus or minus one. This is what the slide says. Or the column, plus or minus one. Probably doesn't take a rocket scientist. There's no point in having that plus there. It's always going to be the minus, right? So the M is the smaller of the row minus one or the column minus one. How many rows did we have? We had two rows. How many columns did we have? We had two columns. So row minus one or R minus one is equal to one and then uh, column minus one, two columns equal to one. So we know that our M, which is the smaller, which they're equal, is one okay so 59 times one 59 right sorry i'm saying a lot is everybody following me yeah okay so yeah yeah it's pretty easy calculation okay so why don't you go ahead and calculate this should be pretty simple too Point two four. Point two four. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna take fourteen point two divided by fifty nine. It's gonna give you well no. So you did that. Now you need to take the square root of it, right? When you take the square uh, root, you're gonna get. So once you do this, you're gonna get point two four. Do this division. You're gonna get point two four. Take the square root, and you're gonna get two forty eight. Point four nine. Okay. So that's how we go about calculating Kramer's V, and you're going to use Kramer's V when lambda doesn't work. Anybody have any questions about that? Good. All right, um, now the last measure of association we're going to be talking about today is gamma. So gamma is a measure of association that we refer to as symmetrical. What do we mean by symmetrical? Um, let's just say you have an independent variable, you have a dependent variable. One's the independent, the other one's the dependent. You calculate uh, gamma. You flip them around, they, they trade places. The dependent variable is now the independent variable. The independent variable is now the dependent variable. You calculate gamma. What's going to happen? They're the exact same number. So unlike lambda, gamma is symmetrical. Lambda is, or gamma is symmetrical. Lambda is asymmetrical. Okay. So with gamma, it doesn't matter which one is the independent variable and which one's the dependent variable. You're going to get the exact same number. Now, again, with gamma, you're trying to determine not just the strength, of the relationship, but you also want to determine whether or not it's a positive or negative relationship. And so with gamma, it can actually give you direction. If you have a negative number, you know it's a negative or inverse relationship. If it's positive, you know that the two variables, they vary in the same direction. Now, like I said, gamma is suitable for use with ordinal level variables. So you need ordinal level data, or you need a dichotomous nominal variable. So you need both to be either ordinal or one to be ordinal or the other one to be dichotomous nominal or both to be dichotomous nominal, okay? You can't have one of them ordinal, one of them nominal and still calculate uh, gamma, it doesn't work. Now, before I, because this is pretty much the last slide, before we get out of here, let's talk about what is a dichotomous nominal variable. A dichotomous nominal variable is any nominal variable where there's only two options, for example, Sex, males, females, two options. Dichotomous, nominal. It's nominal, there's no logical order here, but because there's only two options, you can treat this as ordinal for the purpose of calculating gamma. Did you drink last night? Yes, no. It's nominal, but there's two options. 
do you support capital punishment? Yes, no. It's nominal, but there's two options which makes it dichotomous nominal. For the purpose of calculating gamma, you can treat nominal variables that are dichotomous as ordinal for the purpose of calculating gamma. Um, so that's what we mean by saying something is dichotomous nominal. Um, now, like I said, a measure of association, again, it uh, is one number that summarizes the strength of the relationship. And like I said, if you have ordinal or dichotomous nominal variables, it can determine the direction as well. Obviously, the closer uh, the measure is to one, the stronger the association, the closer it is to zero, the weaker the association. Okay. And as we stated already, the direction, if you see a positive number, you now say positive relationship, the two variables go in the same direction. If you see a negative number with the measure of association, two variables are going in the opposite direction. Okay. Now, that was a mouthful. Anybody have any questions about anything we've discussed so far? So with the gamma, um, the it's symmetrical because numbers the numbers can it won't matter if if the if the independent variable and the variable are switched around it's still yeah. going to get the same result. It's going to get the exact same number, but with lambda, if you switch the independent variable and the dependent variable, you're going to get a different number. Yeah. So, yeah, that's how you know if something's asymmetrical or symmetrical. Gamma is symmetrical, doesn't matter which one's the independent, which doesn't matter which one's the dependent, you're going to get the same number. With lambda, it matters. And so you want to make sure that you're specifying which one's the independent and which one's the dependent. Good. Any other questions? <laughs>